Hello there. Under my analysis video on Kentucky Ballistics accident I posted a few days ago, I've been receiving lots of comments, some containing good questions regarding other potential explanations of the accident, and since they also allow me to talk about a few engineering topics that wouldn't otherwise easily fit in my regular content, I decided to make this additional one. Now, before starting, I have to repeat that I have no more information about the accident than what is available on the internet, so I can't give a definitive explanation. Most importantly, I haven't seen the casing of the round involved in the failure, which is the most important thing in this case. Anyway, in the last video, I said that the threads were stripped by an overload that happened with the last round, and some of you asked if instead it could have been metal fatigue. Again, I can't be 100% sure without a direct observation, but it is unlikely. First of all, when we talk about fatigue, we normally mean high cycle fatigue, which is the one that happens entirely in the elastic range of the material, and that phenomenon requires at the very least a couple thousand cycles to break the part, hence the name high cycle. In order to get a shorter fatigue life, like would have been the case for our rifle, we would need to reach plastic irreversible deformation at each cycle or shot so that our piece could break from what is called low cycle fatigue. But again, this implies that at each shot the threads should have deformed irreversibly. If that would have been the case, it would have soon become impossible to unscrew the cap by hand. Also, fractures due to fatigue have a very typical look and tend to develop much more in tension rather than shear. They typically start from the root of the thread, because that's a stress riser, and then propagate into the material beneath, not along the thread. Without diving too deep, let's just say that it is extremely rare to have a fatigue fracture that looks anything like the one we saw on Scott's gun. That look, on the other hand, perfectly matches that of stripped threads where ductile shearing happened. Okay, but what if instead the threads had worn off from use? That is something that can definitely happen to threads in general, but that damage mode is caused by screwing and unscrewing the thread under load, like it can be the case in a lot of mechanical applications, but not in our case, since the male and female threads are in relative motion only when they are completely unloaded. The next thing I want to do is talk a little more about thread strength and do some rough calculations. What I meant in my last video is that using a thread to resist the load allows making an arbitrarily strong bridge lock, provided the sizing is adequate. In fact, the majority of rifles on the market does rely on a threaded connection to close the bridge, we just don't see it. Most barrel extensions and actions have the barrel screwed in them, and that connection holds almost the same force as the bolt does. We just use a bolt because it is much more practical than unscrewing the barrel extension at each round. The strength of the specific connection for standard threads depends on three main factors. Nominal diameter, pitch, and number of engaged threads but this last one only makes a difference up to about 6, as explained in the first video. In the RN50, the thread used seems to be a 1.5 inch fine pitch thread. Bear in mind that I extrapolated that figure from pictures, so I can't be sure if it's exactly that one or a very similar one of a different standard. The results wouldn't change by much anyway. Regarding the number of engaged threads, from the picture it looked like 4, but some of you suggested that the true engagement of the cap is less than 4 and instead closer to 3, and that would make a difference in strength, so I'm considering this worst scenario. Given this data, we can roughly estimate the stress levels in the thread, generated by a round loaded at the maximum allowed pressure. In this case, the highest equivalent stress in the thread should be somewhere between 5 and 600 MPa. I don't know what the yield strength of that steel is, but if I were to bet, I would say between 9 and 1200 MPa. This would give a safety margin of about 50% in the worst case, which is not exceptional, but still adequate. It means that in order to start deforming the threads, a 50% higher pressure than the maximum allowed would be required, and to actually break the connection, an even higher amount is required. For comparison, the proof test here in Italy is carried with a pressure increase of 25% above the maximum. Just out of caution, if only three threads are effectively engaged, and if I was the maker, I would still increase the thread size to the next one available, which is one and three quarters. At that point, the barrel would bulge badly without the threads failing, that's for sure. In any case, I still think adding vents is the most important improvement to give to the design. As we saw, reaching the failure point with regular bolt thrust is quite hard, not to mention that I didn't account for the fact that the casing itself relieves the bolt of about 20% of the thrust through friction with the chamber walls. On the other hand, if the case fails and gas bleeds into the cap, reaching the failure load becomes quite easy, and that would also explain the violence the cap was thrown back with. Next interesting question, could it have been an obstruction? Sabotage rounds fired through muzzle brakes have been long known to cause all sorts of problems, that's for sure. However, in order to cause an overpressure, obstructions need to happen very close to the breach. As a rule of thumb, 
If the obstruction happens after about one third of the ideal barrel length for the particular caliber, the pressure behind it will never be able to reach above the original pressure peak. At that point, most of the powder charge has already burned, the pressure dropped considerably and the volume available to the gas is, is much larger than in the chamber. There is one place where instead a massive pressure originates and that's between the incoming bullet and the obstruction. The impact can generate massive pressures, almost always enough to bulge the barrel, sometimes even to burst it open. But again, the explosion, if that's how we want to call it, happens where the obstruction is, not at the bridge. What the bridge feels is just a slight increase in pressure and a longer time before it drops. So if a sable had gone stuck in or near the muzzle brake, that's where the damage would be. If it was an obstruction, and that should be visible of one inspection, it must have been very close to the bridge. Next one. Does this kind of accident only happen in cheap guns? Unfortunately, the answer is no. The first example that comes to my mind is with early Blazer R93 straight pull rifles, among the most expensive and sophisticated commercial rifles. A few accidents over the years have happened where the bolt failed and hit the shooter in or near the eye. Again, as far as I know, in all cases the gun was determined to have failed due to a massive overpressure. It doesn't fail during normal use, but if it is made to fail, it gets in your face. And then you've got to stick a thumb in it. Final one. Could the RN50 design have been made fail-safe by using a much longer thread engagement? That valid question originated from the part where I said that after the sixth thread, the load carried is negligible. This means that if a longer engagement was used, after reaching the elastic limit on the first few threads, the rifle would be permanently damaged and go out of service anyway. However, especially if the metal is ductile enough, this could prevent the cap flying back. What happens is that as the most stressed threads yield, the ones behind start bearing a part of the load and the overall load continues to grow until the first thread shears off, hence why ductility is important. So yes, it would work in making the way the gun fails safer, but the damage would still be reversible. It would also be quite impractical to have the cap do that many revolutions each time it needs to be closed or opened. Interrupted threads would solve this issue as well, but that's the topic for another video. In any case, I'm sure all the problems with the design can be fixed with minor effort. I just want to make clear that I have no relationship of any sort with the maker of Said or any other gun mentioned in this video, and I just made it to give my audience some additional knowledge on the matter. Once again, a huge thanks goes to my patrons, which as usual are all listed here. Thank you all for watching, subscribe if you'd like to see more, and I'll see you next time. Bye.